This talk was given at Insight Meditation South Bay. For more information and a schedule of our events, visit the Insight Meditation South Bay website at www.imsb.org. For information about online programs, visit the Bodhi Courses website at www.bodhicourses.org. Bodhi is spelled B-O-D-H-I. When we usually learn about Buddhism, we hear several wisdom teachings on Four Noble Truths, Three Characteristics, Dependent Core Rising, and they all tend to kind of blend together. Um, however, technically speaking, there is one of those teachings, which is Right View, which is for the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are the truths of suffering or stress, its origination, its cessation, and the path to its cessation. The three characteristics are the facts that all fabrications are inconstant, all fabrications are stressful, and all fabrications are not self. Um, the question of those, okay, which of those two really is right view? Uh, there was once a monk, a scholarly monk I heard in Thailand, and I must admit when I was in Thailand I was part of the forest tradition which is very much practice oriented. We tend to look down on the scholarly monks. <laughs> And so he was making the point that um, he had been hearing about different meditation traditions which say that right view is basically seeing things in terms of the three characteristics. He was saying that, no, that's wrong. It's Four Noble Truths. Um, and at first I thought he was being pedantic. But then as I got to know the Buddha's teachings, um, I began to see that the Buddha teach it, treats those two teachings in very different ways. Um, and to give you the basically the essence of tonight's talk is, the Four Noble Truths are the categorical teaching. In other words, they are the most important, the most basic, essential teaching. The three characteristics fall within that context. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means. <clears throat> so that right view, when you say right view comes first, it's the Four Noble Truths. You have to see things in terms of stress, its cause, path to its cessation, the path to its cessation, and the duties that are appropriate to that. The Buddha treated this, as I said, as a categorical teaching, which means that he saw that it was true and beneficial at all times. Whereas with the three characteristics, he treated them as something that was true, but not necessarily always beneficial. You don't always apply them across the board. They have to be applied within the context of the duties that the Buddha said apply to the Four Noble Truths. So if you have only five minutes for tonight's talk, that's the mess message of the talk. Um, the rest now is going to be details. Uh, when the Buddha was asked what he taught, he said basically he taught two things. He taught suffering and the end of suffering. And then the Four Noble Truths expand on this. Suffering is clinging. And the word that is used, used for clinging, upadana, can also mean feeding. And we're not talking just about physical food, but also the mind's tendency to feed off of emotions, to feed off of thoughts, to feed off of relationships. Um, all of these things can, are equivalent to suffering. Um, the, the origination of suffering is craving, three types of craving, and also the ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. The cessation of suffering is dispassion for that craving. In other words, you see the cause of the suffering and you solve the problem at the cause. Um, an image I like to use is you go into your house, you see that it's full of smoke, and instead of putting out the smoke, you put out the fire. If you don't put out the fire, then you, and no matter how much smoke you put out, you'll never come to the end of it. So the craving is the cause. And having dispassion for that craving is going to be the cessation of suffering. The path to the cessation is the Noble Eightfold Path. Now when the Buddha talked about his own awakening, he always talked about it in terms of realizing these four truths. In his accounts for his awakening, he never mentions the three characteristics. It's a, it's a teaching that he used as a technique for helping people gain awakening, but the awakening itself was in terms of the Four Noble Truths. In other words, he starts with truths not about things, but truths about actions. What actions cause suffering? What actions lead to the end of suffering? And the question is, what actions are worth doing and which ones are not worth doing? Or in his terms, what should be done, what should not be done? This, what he said, was the teacher's basic responsibility to a student, is to give you a foundation for saying that there are certain things that should be done if you want to put an end to suffering. Certain things should not be done and realizing that your actions are important and it's worth your while to look into what should and should not be done. 
So we're looking less at the nature of reality out there and more at your, the activities of the mind and figuring out which actions should be done and when. In the search for lasting happiness, each of the Four Noble Truths has a duty. There's the duty of for suffering, which is to comprehend it. And comprehending here means not only understanding it, but understanding it so thoroughly that you have, you develop dispassion for it. In other words, you see through it so clearly that you don't want to get involved with it anymore. We don't think that we're passionate for suffering, but then you look at the way people live their lives, and they're, they're very passionate about things that cause a lot of trouble, a lot of harm for themselves and others. And so if, you, if they really came to understand it, comprehend the suffering, then they would realize it's something they're doing. And actually, you know, suffering is clinging. It's an activity. You're not on, just on the receiving end of suffering. It's something you're actually doing. So you learn how to develop dispassion for it through comprehending it. Um, the duty with regard to the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, is to abandon it. The duty with regard to the cessation is to realize it. And the duty with regard to the path is to develop it. Now within that developing of the path, as you probably realize, mindfulness is one of the parts of the path. Mindfulness is something that should be developed. And in the Buddhist teachings, mindfulness is not just awareness of things as they arise. It's basically your ability to keep in mind the duties of the Four Noble Truths, and when something comes up in your mind, which duty do you apply? Uh, and John Fuhrung, my, my teacher, was saying that one time when he was young, he had a chronic headache that went on for weeks and weeks. And it got so bad that he actually had to have people staying in his room at night for when he woke, woke up with a pain attack. Uh, and one night he woke up and the two monks who were supposed to be looking after him were asleep. And he thought to himself, well, who's looking after whom here? He said, well, long as, as long as I'm up, I might as well meditate. And then he began to realize he'd been trying to solve the suffering, in other words, trying to abandon the suffering rather than trying to comprehend it. So he said, I'm doing the wrong duty. I've got to change the duty. And so that's what the Four Noble Truths are for, is to give you an idea of what should be done with what's coming up. Mindfulness is there to remind you of these duties, so that when you, when you encounter something unskillful in the mind, you let it go. Or really, you remember it to let it go. And when there's something skillful, you remember to develop it. So, in, and within the context of this teaching, then the three characteristics play their role. Um, the role in, is basically is to help to develop dispassion. Now first, however, you have to note that when the Buddha talked about these teachings, about inconstancy, stress, and not-self, he never called them characteristics. In other words, he's not talking about the nature of things as they are. He said he called them perceptions. These are ways you label and perceive things for the sake of dispassion. Um, and, and another point that's important to point out. So you look at the suffering and you try to apply the three characteristics to whatever the suffering is. You look at the cause of suffering and you apply the three characteristics there to develop some, some dispassion for them. Um, for the third noble truth is in itself the dispassion. But with the path, you don't develop dispassion for the path. In other words, you see your concentration arising and it passes away, and you say, ah, insight. The Buddha says, no, you've got to learn how to remember to keep the concentration going. If it falls away, how to give rise to it again. Um, and so within the context of the fourth noble truth, you apply these perceptions selectively. In other words, when you're practicing virtue, anything that would pull you away from the precepts, you learn to perceive that as inconstant, stressful, not self. In other words, something you don't want to get involved with. For example, when the Buddha says, if you're afraid of, by observing the precepts, you're going to lose your wealth, um, then you have to reflect on the fact, well, the wealth is something that's not really lasting, and ultimately it's not yours. If you look at, if you, in the old days when people had money in their, in their pockets, um, you looked on the, on the money and then have your name on the pocket, on the, on the money. It was always the government's name. And even when you have a credit card, it has your name. But whose name is more important, your name or the bank? It's the bank. They can take it back at any time. So you reflect on the fact that wealth is inconstant, and it's not worth sacrificing your virtue for the sake of something that is con inconstant and is going, eventually going to leave you. The Buddha says the same with your health. There's times when you're afraid that if you take the eight precepts and you don't have a meal in the evening, you know, you're going to starve. And you're going to, you know, you're going to suffer malnutrition, which, of course, 
I can speak up for that. I've been observing these precepts now for 40 some years and I, haven't, I don't think I'm mal- malnourished. Um, but there are people who are afraid that by observing the precepts they may not gain the wealth that they would have and then they're, they're not, not going to be well nourished and then they're, they're going to suffer. You have to realize even wealth, health is something that eventually is going to have to leave you. You've got this body get the best use out of it instead of just trying to preserve the body. You don't want to die with a well-preserved body, right? <laughs> That's not what we're here for, um, no matter what they tell you otherwise. Um, you realize that okay, my, my virtue is more important than that. Similarly with concentration, when you find that there is something that is going to pull you out of your concentration, you reflect, okay, this is inconstant, stressful, not self. With the concentration itself, however, you're trying to make a state of mind that is constant, easeful, under your control. So you don't apply the three perceptions to your concentration as you're developing it. The same with your discernment. An insight arises, you apply that. Anything that would get in the way of your insights, okay, then you see as in constant stress will not self. So they're applied to things that, are, that would pull you off the path. It's only when the path is fully developed then you apply these perceptions across the board. So you apply these perceptions when they're beneficial and you get a sense of when they're beneficial in the context of the Four Noble Truths and the duties that are appropriate to them. So the teaching doesn't only start with the question of what is to be done. In fact, that's what the Buddha said at the beginning of the sermon is what when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and suffering, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. That's not only there at the beginning but also at as the insights come in, it's a question of what is worth doing, what is not worth doing. It's insight into actions and the results, and which, which actions are worth following through with, which ones are, are to be put aside. Um, as I said earlier, when the Buddha talks about his own awakening, it's always expressed with reference to the Four Noble Truths. The three de- characteristics are not mentioned at all, or three perceptions are not mentioned in that context. Now what happened over the history of the Buddhist teachings, is that by the time the teachings got into the commentaries, the relative roles of the Four Noble Truths and the Three Characteristics got switched. Um, it was in the commentaries, for one, that these three perceptions became three characteristics. And they became a metaphysical teaching about the way things are. Nothing has any essence. Um, the teaching on not-self, which is basically disidentifying with something, becomes a teaching of there is no self. With very different teaching. Um, the Buddha himself, when he was asked whether or not a self existed, he refused to answer. He didn't take a stance on that. Um, the, as he taught not self, it was more as a strategy for learning how to get rid of things that you're attached to, that you realize are, are unhealthy. And it's important to realize that not self is not something that's exotic and it belongs only to the high realms of the practice. And so we're doing not self all the time. In other words, you decide from moment to moment what things you're going to identify with and which things you're not going to identify with. And we tend to do it fairly randomly. Um, I'll give you an example. Suppose you're a child, you have a younger sister. Somebody down the street is beating up on your younger sister. If she's your sister, you're going to go down and defend her, get her back home. You bring her back home. She starts playing with your toy truck. <laughs> she's suddenly not your sister, she's the other. You know. Um, and you think about it, the way you go through life, you, we tend to divide this line between what is self and what is not self, and what is ours and what is not ours, fairly randomly as we go through the day. What the Buddha is asking us is to try to be a little bit more systematic and thoughtful about where you draw the line and when you're going to change the goalposts, why you're, ch- why you're changing the goalposts. However, in the, three, in the commentaries, as I said, this teaching on not self becomes a teaching that there is no self. And then the three characteristics become the context for the Four Noble Truths. These become the categorical teaching. And when you put the three characteristics as the basic picture of reality and then say, well, given this is the way reality is, then we're going to understand the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths get changed as well. One of the changes that came in was not so much that clinging is suffering, clinging causes suffering, because we cling to impermanent things. Now this is not what the Buddha said. He said clinging in and of itself, regardless of what you try to cling to, permanent or impermanent, is going to be suffering. Because remember the the position of clinging is that you're basically hanging on to feed on something. 
And even if you try to, are hanging on to feel on something permanent, the fact that you're having to hang on, there's a lot of stress within that, that activity in and of itself. Um, second change that happened to the Four Noble Truths is ignorance is not ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, it becomes ignorance of the three characteristics. We're ignorant, we, we assume permanence. If people realize that things were impermanent, they wouldn't cling, and therefore they wouldn't suffer. And this, in this context, becomes the purpose of mindful pra mindfulness practice, is to see how things change, and realize, ah yes, things are impermanent. So these are the big changes that come into the Four Noble Truths when you put them into the context of the three characteristics. Um, other changes that happen in the commentary is their picture of experience becomes more passive. We're on the receiving thing of end, re receiving end of things. Excuse me. Um, things come and make contact, and then we react. Whereas in the Buddha's earlier teachings, where the mind is much more proactive, it's out there looking for things. And the Buddha actually said, all things that we experience, aside from nirvana, are based on desire. It's our desire to feed. It's our desire to gain things in life that shapes and uh, totally shapes our experience. You might say we're always out there looking for trouble. Um, it's, and what we see and what we perceive depends on what we're hungry for. There was a far side cartoon where a nuclear war is happening and people are running around in the city and, the, and there's one car comes to a, a stop at a stoplight at an intersection and there's a dog in the car looking outside and there's another dog on the, on the curb. And with all these people running around, fires burning everywhere, atom bombs going off, and the, the, the caption was, you know, finally Fido saw something that attracted his attention. <laughs> so in other words, we go through life looking for certain things and we find it and we, you know, we miss everything else. Um, whereas in, in, the three in, the, in the commentaries, the picture of our experience becomes more passive. We're on the receiving end of things. We misunderstand them thinking that they're permanent, so we try to hang on. If we understood that they weren't permanent, we would let go and that would be the end of the problem. That's like saying, you realize that food is impermanent, your stomach is impermanent, so you just give up eating. It hasn't worked for me, I don't know if it works for you. <laughs> and so within the context of the commentary, they saw awakening as the act of affirming the truth of the three characteristics. And particularly seeing or arriving at right view is when you realize that there is no self. Now that's the picture of the commentary. It's not the picture that the Buddha gave in his original teachings. Um, and when you look at modern Buddhism, you begin to see that the position of the commentaries has been per, um, perpetuated as we bring Buddhism here to the West. For example, you look at treatments of the Four Noble Truths. Um, a couple of years back I was working on a book on the, on the Eightfold Path, so I started looking around at other people's books on the Eightfold Path, and I saw that in, inevitably when they start talking about right view, they will mention the Four Noble Truths and then the discussion immediately goes to the three characteristics. The reason we suffer is because things are impermanent, we cling to them not realizing that they're impermanent. If we stopped, if we, un we only understood that they were impermanent, there would be no suffering. The Buddha's awakening is described as the realization, again, of the three characteristics. Even the teachers who reject the Four Noble Truths, and there are some secular Buddhists who say, the Buddha didn't teach the Four Noble Truths, he just taught the Four. You heard that? No. He said, these aren't truths, they're not noble, they're just four of them. <laughs> um, but even those people will say, okay, impermanence is the truth that Buddhism teaches. You've probably heard this many times again. Buddhism is all about change, right? Um, well, no. And the four, there are four misunderstandings that come from this. One is the belief that there is no self, that means that there is no agent. People suffer because they think they can resist change. It creates a very passive picture of what human beings can do. Basically saying, we have no agency in life. I've seen people, teachers, say that, hey, we have no free will. As if this were a Buddhist teaching. It's not. Uh, years back, a couple years back, I was practicing my French. I was going to go over and teach in France, and I thought I might be able to revive my French. It was, it was moribund. Um, <laughs> however, I did try for a while to watch some things on, on, on YouTube. They were, there's, there's a show called Sagesse Bouddhiste. It's an interview show that they have. Can you imagine here in America having an interview show with Buddhist teachers once a week on a Sunday morning? Um, and they had this one teacher on there, though, who was saying that the important part of... Um, 
the practice is realizing that you have no agency at all and that you just have to learn how to accept nature as it is, that you can't resist it. And this gives you, there's a sense of peace that comes with not trying. And the interviewer, who was generally a very sort of warm and welcoming and sort of motherly type figure, said, well, isn't this sort of pessimistic and defeatist? And the woman being interviewed said, oh, only if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's one of the big misunderstandings that we come to, is that there is no agency, there is no self, you just might as well just learn how to accept things as they are, and you suffer because you resist change, so just, just don't resist. A second misunderstanding that comes from this is that there is no long-term happiness. Pleasures and pains just come and go without you being able to extend the pleasures or shorten the pains. You just have to learn how to live with these things, uh, with equanimity. Um, the definition of clinging becomes clinging means to assume that things are that things are permanent. Um, so we, we learn how to hold on briefly, realizing impermanence. If we do, if we hold on just briefly, it doesn't count as clinging. So you embrace the moment. You're fully in the moment, with no expectations for the future. And then they say, okay, that it means no suffering. That's the third misunderstanding that comes. The image you often there are several images that are often here used here. One is image of a dancer. How many times have you heard Dharma talks talking about life as a dance? There are a lot of them who do it. And it's a kind of dance where you're switching partners all the time, and they're switching rhythms all the time, and they're switching, switching the dance mode all the time. But you learn how to just kind of go with the flow. That's one image. Another image is you're sitting on a beach, watching the waves come ashore, and you realize, okay, you may like some of the waves and may not like some of the other waves, but there's really nothing you can do about the fact that the waves are going to keep coming. So you might as well learn how to accept the fact that you can't hold on to the good waves and you can't push away the bad waves. Just learn how to accept it. A fourth misunderstanding is that clinging means holding on to fixed views. There are no duties in Buddhism uh, because things are always changing. There are no recommendations for what your individual path might be. Uh, right and wrong are always changing, so there are no trustworthy judgments as to what are right or wrong or even right or wrong ways of interpreting the Dharma. Therefore, oh, you accept all change and you'll be free. Um, watching Sajjas Buddhist, I also saw another, another t um, exchange with an interviewer. This time they had a French Buddhologist on there who was trying to explain dependent core arising. And the interviewer was saying, could you please explain dependent core arising? You know, what, what are the practical implications? Could you give some um, incidents in day-to-day -day life? where it's relevant. And even making the point that dependent core rising is all about how things change all the time. And he said, well, if you have two lovers, you have to accept the fact that their love is going to change from day to day. And the look on her face showed that she was not buying this. <laughs> you know, if your French husband tells you my love for you is going to change from day to day, you know what that means. <laughs> This is a very French interpretation of dependent core rising that we're getting here. <laughs> so, so th this is all these misunderstandings that cl you know, clinging means holding on to fixed views, that there is no self, there's no long-term happiness, and to cling means to assume things are, are permanent. All of these are misunderstandings that come from putting the three characteristics before the Four Noble Truths, saying that these are the context then the Four Noble Truths fit within, within it. So he asks himself, what kind of views are these? Well, they're defeatist, and they can also be irresponsible. Hey, my love for you is different. You've got to accept it today. I'm having my affair. I'll, I may have my end of the affair in a couple of days, but accept the affair while it's happening. And as I said, they're not very realistic. The idea being, if you just learn to accept things as impermanent, then you wouldn't cling. It's like saying, okay, I've had enough food because it's impermanent, so I'm just going to stop feeding. So let's go back and look at what the Buddha actually taught to get rid of these misunderstandings. One is that clinging is to feed. We cling not with the assumption of impermanence, but we think it's worth the effort. There are a lot of things you cling to. You know they're not permanent. You know they're inconstant. And if I'm going to cling to this, this mic, I know that you know, this mic eventually will end. But I'm still going to cling anyhow. As long as I feel it's worth clinging on, clinging, worth holding on to, I'm going to hold on to this. Um, if you just say, well, I'm just going to embrace things in the moment and let go, you're a serial clinger. You 
I'll let that sink in. Um, okay. Okay, the Buddha's strategy in, the, in this context is to see the drawbacks of this feeding process that we're constantly going on. And this is the role of the three, three, three perceptions, is seeing that certain ways that you've been feeding are really not worth it. But the Buddha also has to give you an alternative way to feed. And this is what the role of the path is. Um, Shaila has been talking to you about jhana for since who knows when. Jhana is your main food on the path. Right concentration gives you a sense of well-being, gives you a sense of ease, gives you a sense of stability inside. That can provide you with a temporary f source of food so that as you look at the other ways of feeding, feeding on sensuality, feeding on different um, plans that you have for your life, and you realize that these, these would involve unskillful actions, you would basically say, okay, I don't need to feed on those things because I got something better. Okay. It's only when the, the path is totally complete that you want to apply to the three perceptions, even to the practice of concentration. Um, so the Buddha's image for arriving at the goal is that you're going to stand on firm ground. Now to get to firm ground, he says, you've got to get across the river. Now getting across the river involves the path. You've probably heard the raft the raft image. Okay, think about it for a bit. Um, one, the river is composed of bad waves. It's not a question of putting good in quotes or bad in quotes. The waves will pull you away. Um, one, of the wa one of the waves of the river or one of the currents of the river is this, fl what the Buddha calls the flood of views. You get carried away by your views and you hold on to certain things that are going to lead you to do unskillful things which is going to lead you to bad, bad destinations. He talks about there being whirlpools and sharks and snakes and crocodiles and waterfalls down, down the river. So you don't want to get swept down the river. You want to get onto firm ground. So you put together a raft that's based, made out of the fabrications. And we think about the five aggregates, if you've heard about the five aggregates. There's form, feeling, perception, fabrication, and, and consciousness. And this, these are the things that, if you cling to them, are going to be suffering, but you have to use them for the path. So, and it's, I think it's important to realize when the Buddha talks about the raft image, he's not talking about a yacht image. In other words, you put together things out of the things that you have been using in the past to create suffering, but now you're going to put them together in a new way. For instance, in the state of concentration. Just now we're focusing on the breath, which is form. We're trying to develop a feeling of ease. That's the feeling, aggregate of feeling. We're using a perception of the breath as something that can fill the whole body. You're f fabricating thoughts about it, ev evaluating the breath. Is the breath good? If, what, what kind of breathing would be comfortable? When you've got some comfortable breathing, how do you spread this? That's fabrication. And finally, consciousness is your awareness of all these things. So you're taking these aggregates, which if you cling to them, will be suffering. You put them together in a new way. These are your new raft. Now this is, the raft is not the same thing as the goal. You get over to the goal, you get to the firm ground, you let go of the raft. But in order to get to, to that, get across there, you've got to hold on to these fabrications, which is why you do not apply the three perceptions to the fabrications while you're going across. Otherwise you get swept away. So you hold on, and when you finally get to the other side, that's when you say, okay, I've, I've used the raft, I don't need it anymore, and you can leave it there. And that's when you're, we're totally on firm ground. So this is, this is the Buddha's image. We're crossing over the river. We're using things that eventually we will have to let go of. And so you have to hold on to them. Don't apply the three characteristics to these things as you're using them. Remember, because you're actually fulfilling the duty of the Fourth Noble Truth, which is to develop the path. Um, so what this is giving you is an image that you're not helpless. You are in control. You're the one who's making the decisions. And we notice also that, you know, that river includes the flood of views, but the raft itself includes the right view. This is a truth that's always true and always relevant, which is why the Buddha said it's categorical. It's always beneficial to hold on to that. This image of the path also is something you are responsible, and the teaching is also responsible. It gives you guidelines for what you should and shouldn't do. However, this particular right view that the Buddha teaches with the Four Noble Truths contains the seeds for its own transcendence. Because when you've completed the path, it's gotten you almost to where you want to go. You turn around and you look at it and begin to realize, okay, this too involves some clinging. 
this too involves some suffering. There's, there is stress in, in the practice of concentration, there's stress in the practice of virtue. And then you begin to realize, okay, this too has to be abandoned. Because it's been teaching you all along to look for wherever there's clinging, you want to let go. So this is why right view works as getting you across, because it teaches you to look at the actions of your own mind. And to see, where am I holding on to things that are causing stress? What can I do to let go? And then finally, when you've got to the point where you don't need the raft anymore, then you look at that, and you let go of that, and then you're free. And so you, you think about the, the common interpretation based on the three characteristics. It, it basically is kind of a defeatist approach. So, well, I, it's like that cartoon where Calvin is making a snowman and he's telling Hobbes, you know, I don't want to force myself to have too high expectations, otherwise I'll be miserable. So he makes a snowman that only has two parts of the body <laughs> and there's no head. And Hobbes is saying, remind me to invest overseas, okay? So that's the defeatist attitude. But the Buddha actually said that his name for his path is the unexcelled victory in battle. You're going to overcome your attachments and you may re 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 arrive at a, at a destination where you find an ultimate happiness. So this seemingly pedantic point makes a big difference. Okay. Which teaching you're going to take as, as the container and which is going to be in, inside the container. And you have to ask yourself, which do you want? And the Buddha says it is possible to find a long-term happiness and also on your way across the river and ultimately to arrive at an ultimate happiness. These things are available. He's been giving swimming lessons for 2,600 years. Um, whereas the three characteristic dharma tends to side with the advertising industry. They say that total unchanging happiness is impossible, so content yourself with sitting on the shore as the waves come in. We'll bring you drinks and umbrellas. But don't count on us when climate changes and the waves get big. Okay. So the choice is yours. Okay. So, that's, so put, for, put right view first and you'll benefit. Okay. Those are my thoughts for the evening. I was wondering if you had any questions. Yes? This is the first time I've heard this position described. Uh, mm -hmm. Two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, since you speak quickly. Sorry. Of the Four Noble Truths? Okay. And then, would you mind commenting on how is it that this switch in emphasis mm -hmm. did occur, but has not been um, debunked? Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, it's the first time I've been around. Okay, well, okay, it's... Um, first, the Four Noble Truths and their duties. Um, the duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. In other words, remember, suffering is the clinging, and by comprehending it, you understand what, what the Buddha gives a, a long list of things that involve suffering, but then he boils it down to the five clinging aggregates, and it's the clinging that makes them makes them suffering. And so you want to comprehend that when you are suffering from something, you have to ask yourself, what am I clinging to? And there are different kinds of clinging. There's clinging to sensuality. There's clinging to views and, and and clinging to habits and practices and clinging to doctrines of the self. So you want to identify what kind of clinging is involved right here. And then when you begin to see, oh, it's, I'm holding on to these things and it's making me suffer, is it worth it? And when you can develop the understanding, no, it's not worth it, then you let go. Now, involved in that is also to see, well, where is the cause of this clinging? Because you can't attack the clinging directly. The cause of the clinging is the craving. The word for craving in Pali also means thirst. And so you, know, you think of the, the analogy that there's a thirst that drives you to feed. And so you want to abandon that thirst. And so you look at, well, why is it I'm thirsty for these things? And so because you're ignorant that they're going to cause suffering. Um, the, the duty with regard to the third noble truth, which is the cessation of suffering, is to comprehend it, or to realize it, to actually experience it directly. And then the duty with regard to the fourth noble truth, which is the path, is something you develop. So you develop concentration, you develop right mindfulness, you develop right effort, right view, right, right speech, right action, all the, all the factors of the path. So those are the duties that are involved here. Um, 
in terms of how this misunderstanding came about, <clears throat> the Buddha warned the monks not to get involved in debates. But the problem was Indian culture back in those days, the debate culture was very alive. And there was a tradition that when a new king came into power, he would pose questions to the religious teachers of the day and have them debate their answers to the questions. And he would decide whose, whose answers he liked, and he was going to support that religion. And so some people got too tempted. They say, we can't let, you know, we can't let the Jains or the whatever get all the support. <coughs> and so there were Buddhist monks who got involved in some of these debates. This is where you see the developed the, the commentary literature, the Buddhist universities that came up from India, which was to train the, train the students in debate. And when the Buddha was teaching, he was very careful about which questions he would answer and which questions he would put aside. On the grounds that certain questions, if you try to answer them, pull you away from the path, pull you away from understanding how to put an end to suffering. Um, now, when the king is posing the questions, you can't say, that's a dumb question. <laughs> and one of the questions that was posed again and again and again, is there a self? What is the true self? I mean, we hear this even in our, our, you know, our, our culture, the, the spiritual question is, what is, who is the true me? Um, and if the Buddha said, hey, the, you know, the Buddha didn't, say, didn't answer that, they're out. And so they worked on developing an answer, and they finally came to the answer, there is no self. And then that took over. Now the Buddha had warned, if you, try, if, you, if you hold to the view that there either is a self or there is no self, you're going to get involved in a tangle of views, a fetter of views, a wilderness of views, a writhing of views. Those are his terms. And you look at the history of Buddhist, psych, Buddhist philosophies from the point when they came to the conclusion there is no self, it is a writhing and a wilderness and a fetter and it's been a mess ever since. <laughs> I'm not, the person, I'm not the first to debunk this. I mean, in the forest tradition, John Lee has some great passages on how people are in much too great a hurry to get to the three characteristics. You know, they're, they're there for certain purposes, but don't just grab onto them right away. So, learn how to use them at the proper time and place, basically. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Now that I have to look at my notes, I can look where my glasses. Yes. It's to look at the things you crave and ask yourself: Is it really worth all the stress and suffering that goes into it? The Buddha talks about five, five steps in overcoming craving. The first one is to see the craving arise, and not just arise. What makes it arise? What's the origination? The second part of this, this fivefold um, path is to see it pass away. And then begin to realize that sometimes there's a craving that seems to be just driving you again and again and again. Well, it comes and then it goes, and then you dig it up again. And then it goes again, then you dig it up again. And you have to, you have to see that process, because then you begin to realize, okay, this is something that I'm, it's not just, you know, craving and coming like this big monster that's coming and going to come and get me. I've been actually involved in giving rise to this. <clears throat> and as you dig it up again, then you look for the third question, which is, what is the allure? What is it about this that I really find appealing? You know, let's say you have a problem with anger. You have to ask yourself, oh, well, there, I, part of me does not like the anger, but part of me enjoys it. You have to look for that. And ask yourself, when you, when you do see it, it's okay, if this were, if this were kind of feeding, what kind of food would it be? You know? And some of the stuff is like, you know, the stuff that dogs bury and then they dig up again and they roll in it. And we can really realize, gosh, I really would, would be embarrassed to have somebody pay, take an you know, Instagram of me if they could see my mind right now. And that's when you look at the fourth step, which is to see the drawbacks. And this is where the contemplation of inst you know, inconstancy, stress, not self, comes in. This whatever pleasure I'm getting out of this is not going to last. It's going to leave me doing things that I'm later going to regret. I'm going to have the karma that comes from having acted on it. Is this worth doing? When you see it's stressful, inconstant stressful, you, you come to the conclusion. When the, when the Buddha has that questionnaire, you know, if things are inconstant, 
Are they easeful or stressful? They're stressful. And then he says, if things are in constant and stressful, he doesn't ask you to come to the conclusion that there is no self. The conclusion is, are they worth claiming as yours? And this is where it's useful to have an image in the mind of your mind like a committee. There are lots of voices in the committee. And you've been identifying with different voices. And you begin to say, is, do I want to identify with this voice? You might find it even useful to learn how to identify, where did this voice come from? Ah, oh, that's my mother. Or that's my teacher. Or these are my friends. Or this is I picked up from the media. I have one student who is a Trekkie. And she's learned how to identify the different voices in her mind, you know, with different Trek characters. <laughs> um, which I think is carrying a little too far, but... <laughs> you learn how to step back from them. That's the important thing. And John Lee has the image that, he said, you know, have, you have all these, you know, germs and other things going through your bloodstream. Maybe they're going through your brain right now and they're leaving behind a thought. Do you, you don't have to identify with every thought that comes into the mind. Now, put the, another problem, of course, is it's not just the mind. There's a sense of that the thought has invaded your body. And you attack that by saying, okay, I can breathe in a different way to counteract the effects of that particular way of thinking, that, that way it's kind of it's seized my breath, it's hijacked my breath. I can learn how to reclaim it as mine. So that's, that's the approach. And then the, the fifth step is to develop dispassion based on comparing the allure to the drawbacks and realizing the drawbacks are much greater. I don't want to go for that anymore. There's a question in the back. But you got to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, you have to learn how to reflect a little bit more on your role as a mother, which is that you you don't know how long you're going to have the kids, how long you're going to be there. You have to accept that fact and say, in the meantime, what is the best thing I can give to my kids so I can give them a parting gift. Realize, okay, ultimately, you're going to be parting ways. That may be a long time. In fact, there might become a point you say, couldn't we part ways a little faster? Enough? <laughs> but in the meantime, you've got these responsibilities. So you don't let them, you don't abandon them. But you have to learn to wear them a little bit more lightly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over here. Yeah, right. And so you tell yourself, okay, it's like driving to a mountain on the horizon. And if you're driving along and all you're doing is looking at the mountain on the horizon, you're going to drive off the road. So you say, okay, this road goes to the mountain, so I'll fo focus on the road. What do I need to do? What are the steps that will lead me there? And then every now and then check in your rear view mirror to make sure the mountain is not behind you. <laughs> but you focus on the road. as long as you need it. Um, the question you always have to ask yourself is, are my views really right or is there something I've misunderstood? And the way to check that is act on them and then look at the results. And the Buddha has a nice sutta, I, I can't go into all the details right now, but it's Majjhima Nikaya 61, where he's teaching his son, seven years old, basically saying, before you act, ask yourself, do I anticipate any harm coming from this? If you anticipate harm, don't do it. If you don't anticipate harm, go ahead and do it. While you're doing it, look for the action, results that are actually coming from the action. If you see harm, stop. If you don't see any harm, continue. When the action is done, then you reflect on the long-term results. 
And this is when you begin to realize, okay, there's something I thought was okay, but actually it turned out not to be okay. Okay, you've just chipped away at some delusion. And so you, you take the mistake not as you know, an indication that you're a lousy practitioner, but just, this is, here I am perfecting my right view. And then you talk it over with someone who's further advanced on the path to get some advice. And this is how you learn how to learn from your mistakes, because that's the only way we get past delusion is to, what was it, the, the, the engineers say, you, you become a good engineer through, ex, you, know, you do things right because of experience, and you gain experience because you did things wrong. So learn how to learn from having done something wrong. I mean, the problem is you just make a mistake and you just keep repeating it. There's no growth there. But you have to be, the way the Buddha presents this to his son, it starts out with talking about honesty. You have to be really honest with yourself about what you did, what the results are. But that's, that's our only guarantee. Any other questions? What time do we have to stop? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Okay. okay. One more question. Okay, there, um, I mean, there are certain things that are going to come from your past karma you've got to accept. The fact that, that you know, this, this fact is there in the world and I have to accept it. But then the next question is, okay, how do I learn not to suffer from it? And in terms of boundaries, that has to do with your relationships with other people. Um, and again, you don't just accept everything that comes. You have, to, you have to establish a boundary. This idea of total acceptance is a very romantic idea. If you, you might be interested in reading a book I did called Buddhist Romanticism, where it talks about what romantic ideas have gotten into Western Buddhism. And, and it's important to realize that you do have to draw your boundaries as to what is appropriate and what's not. And given the amount of time I have, that's all I can say. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.